we're very excited to be with you, all of you here. We're going to be talking about how might we design a social enterprise that is appropriate for the time that we live in. And it is the 21st century, although we're already 20 years into it. Um, but recent events might say that we need to pay more attention about how we can be more updated. So um, without further ado, I'm just gonna do a quick intro of myself and then with my partner, Liz, Liz Elizabeth Lemke, she'll introduce herself much better than me doing it. So I am an organization leadership psychologist. I'm very passionate about working with organizations to help them design and shift their cultures, especially amidst times of complexity and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And while they do it grounded in purpose and humanity, the performance and the quality of output is still important. My experiences include ING Bank, Honeywell, Johnson, and increasingly now more and more, I work with NGOs and startups. I grew up in Canada, was born in Malaysia. I've been very fortunate to live and work in several countries. And right now I call Amsterdam home. Liz. Well, I love it. Um, and I am honored to be here today. I'm really excited. My name is Elizabeth Lemke. I am also a work and cultural um, organizational psychologist. Um, I am based out of Germany, um, but I'm originally from Oregon, hence the green. Um, I am, um, I've been working, um, we'll just put it 15 years plus in uh, strategic HR, um, but also very practical HR. Um, I did my original stint in machining, then went over to um, automotive, um, was in an automotive supplier for a number of years. I may be waving to some more former colleagues who are here in the room. Um, and I have been an independent consultant for the last two years um, doing transforming talent. Um, because that has is really my uh, my calling is work takes up a significant portion of our lives. Um, how do we enjoy it? How do we tap into that verve and potential that's within people so that we really look at what is the impact growth and the relationships that we can have at work? Um, and so that's that's why I'm excited to talk here today about, you know, your organization doesn't have to look like one from 1962. There are a lot of different options and really thinking about what kind of op organization you want it to be. Um, that's really the first step. So that's me and I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. So let's get going. Um, and we also have Niha who is helping us um, with the slides. So Niha, let's stay on this slide for the next minute or so. I'm gonna just frame the session a little bit. So to say that the world is changing rapidly is really stating the obvious these days. It's also obvious to say that life is increasingly complex and uncertain. These are all true and it'll probably continue to be true for the next many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a lot of anxiety surrounding the workplace, the future of work. There are, you know, people are looking into changing values of society. In particular, the next generation probably demands changes in power structure and how they experience work. Put all that together with, there are also very complicated feelings around technology. Some might be fearing that it will kill jobs and exacerbate inequality in life. Um, and some people believe it will bring in a utopia where everybody gets to do more meaningful work and societies will become healthier. And I think all of us know that there are elements of truth and fiction in all of those because it's very hard for us to predict how these things will interact. But the thing that we cannot forget is we have agency. We have a, a choice. We have the ability to make decisions. And then we also have the ability to impact the outcome. But in the midst of all of that, we also have the ability to pay more attention to what is changing around us and adapt. So that is a big part of what we wanna to talk to you today. Despite all of the noise on the topic of the future of work, we believe that at the end of everything, the heart of it is we need to find people to find it meaningful and motivating to do great work with us. That's it. We yep. need to find people who will find it meaningful and motivating to do great work with us. So um, as to, you know, to pick up what Liz said earlier, one of the examples I like to use is imagine you are planning to go to 
a three day workshop. And somebody told you that two of those two days, two of those three days will be extremely boring and not relevant at all to your goals. Only one of those days will be good. Will you still go? The funny thing is when you put it in a, in a clear, simple example like that, most people will be able, well, of course I won't go, that's silly. But the truth is we spend more than two thirds of our wake, waking lives working. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if, a, if that huge chunk of time also brings us joy and meaning and fulfillment. So instead of saying, you know, the hours I put into work are a means to an end, I can put up with a lot so that I have a comfortable life. I would say, let's remind ourselves with this simple example of the three day workshop, it can be different. Yeah. So overall, what we'd like to do is to take you through a very engaging 50 minutes, hopefully, um, towards the question of how to create an enterprise that works for people so that people want to work for you. And the good news is it's actually quite doable. What we'll share with you is actually coming from years and years of working directly with organizations through their many stages of transformation, um, through implementing, through helping them implement and watching the ways that people in groups respond to changes in their environment. So it's not any great theory, but it's practical observations and a framework that uh, we hope that will be hope, um, useful to you. So Niha, if you go to the next screen, uh, the next slide, it will, this is what to expect. We're not gonna do a lot of lectures. This is probably the longest that you will hear us talk, um, or like in one breath, <laughs> because, <laughs> because lectures are a fantastic way of teaching, but a terrible way of learning. So here you go. This is a masterclass, it's not very long, and it's really a taster of what all the components are that we want to share with you. And we can certainly dig in deeper into this at a different time. Over to you, Liz. Perfect, I love it. All right, so moving forward, we're gonna ask, you know, we're gonna take the, the framework and use it as a guide and then really to say, okay, how do you make it your own, okay? So after this, uh, you will be um, a bit of bet better prepared to say, okay, what do you want uh, to have out of your ideal organization? So as we move forward in the, in the deck, we're gonna be looking at, um, how are we diving in? And you will get more out of this. Okay, so um, moving forward, um, one more. Okay, all right. So what I would like you to do now is envision your ideal organization. What does it look like? What does it feel like? How, do, how does information flow in this ideal organization that you're in? How do you deal with customers? How do customers deal with you? How integrated are your suppliers? Do people really want to buy your product or your services? And do the people doing the work to deliver on those great services, how do they feel about working for you? Okay, so we're gonna be looking at what is your ideal organization, okay? So moving to the next slide, we're gonna say, what does that look like? Okay, so, Many of you, I am assuming, have been on Zoom a couple of times, um, particularly throughout this week. And we're gonna use the beautiful annotate uh, um, option where I want you to use the check mark and please tell me where you think your ideal organization is. So we're, we have a four square model because you know, as HR people, we love diagrams and we love four squares. So the, the different axes are, okay, a future forward organization, creating opportunities. And the other pole of that is um, very present focus in terms of how are we seizing opportunities? So what's there? How can we get at it? How can we make it ours? Um, the other axis is task efficiency. So really making sure that um, the efficiency, the time to do things and, and the, the structured processes of how we get work done, that that's highly efficient. Or the other axis of that is people exploration. So here looking at um, sensing, how are we understanding what's around? So as you think about your ideal organization, is it, where does it land? Where would you plot it on this particular screen? So thinking about um, where you want to go, okay? So this is that, that bright future. 
taking the check mark. So if you go into the annotate, you go usually to the top of your screen and then under view options, if you click down, the option of annotate should be available to you. And you'll see it is the fourth uh, area over that says stamp. And I'll just show you how that works. So you just go in the stamp. So I'm just gonna go here, for example, stamp. So if you could all please just tell me where on this plot would your ideal organization land in terms of future creating opportunity, people exploration, seizing opportunities, or really being very efficient when it comes to the tasks and the work that you're doing. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right. So if you want to draw the line, that's fine as well. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So um, here we have somewhere between future creating opportunities and people exploration as the ideal. Okay. And we're going to explore that a little bit more. Okay. So let's move forward one ana animation and we're going to use a different stamp. Okay. So now we're going to use the stamp of the X. Okay. So using the X, we're going to say, where is your organization now? Okay. So X marks the spot. Where do you see yourself right now in terms of this plot? Are you more around the task efficiency? Are you more around the seizing opportunities that are in front of you? Where do you see your organization being right now? Okay, somewhere on the, okay. Seizing opportunities, um, people exploration, okay. Very, very good. Okay. So now what do we notice? <laughs> um, so as we move forward, we notice that there may be a little bit of a gap. All right. So moving forward um, in the slides, we'll also see where, you know, where does this gap come from? So as you think for yourself, all right. So moving forward, just one. Um, what is that aspect that, um, where does this gap come from? And what would be that big impact as we look to these gaps as to where we would like to go? Um, Neha? Can, okay. So, and if you think about those gaps, what's the most important one to you? Okay, so perhaps you put the X um, more towards um, seizing opportunities and really around task efficiency. But as you look to your future organization around how are you creating opportunities that perhaps weren't there before, or really using that aspect of how are we exploring what's out there and what could really be a value add in terms of what does the customer's customer actually need? Um, what's that, that, that origin or purpose behind it and being more explorative in the, um, the way you go about your business. What is that most important gap for you? Okay, so moving forward um, in the annotation or in the, in the slide deck. Yeah. Yeah, let's go to the next part. Yeah. Thank you, Niha. So, Oh, we might need to clear the I annotation. Will clear. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're now at this point where I hope all of you can participate. It's very simple. We're actually going to dig into what are some of the organizational myths or are they fact? We don't know. There are lots of things that people believe about organizations or culture or leadership or effective work. So what we will do is we'll actually share, show you questions and it's gonna be a quiz, pop quiz. <laughs> All right, good. Number one, you will get to respond to this question. Quiz question number one. It is best to get things right the first time. Please respond. Is it fact or myth? So due to time, we're going to put a time limit on this. We will only give 10 seconds for response. All right. You have three more seconds. Three, 
two, one. End the poll, please. And the response is 85% of you believe it is a myth. That is absolutely, Niha, next page, please. Absolutely true. This is a myth because the more, the sooner you are able to get, um, the, the, the earlier you can get feedback on whatever it is that you're building, the sooner you can iterate and make it increasingly relevant for whoever's going to use it. So waiting and perfecting it is never the best way to go, pretty much. Wonderful, good job. Number two, let's move on to quiz question number two. And that is, any initiative will stick if it comes down from the CEO. 10 seconds, let's go. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Excellent, let's end this. And 77% of you believe this is a myth. Let's look at the answer. The answer is indeed, this is a myth because just because the CEO says we should do this, it doesn't mean it will be a successful initiative. Mm -hmm. It may have the authority to start everybody doing some activity, but mm -hmm. there is no guarantee that that amount, that just having that authority top down is going to produce the outcome that you want. It's actually the movement and the connection people have with that initiative that's gonna create the outcome. Awesome, you guys are doing great. Number three, let's go to question number three. <clears throat> culture does not take years to change. 10 seconds, culture does not take years to change. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Woohoo! This is almost a dead heat, 55, mm -hmm. 45. All right. This is wonderful. And the answer is, uh, it's mostly a fact. Mm -hmm. It is mostly a fact that culture does not necessarily need to take years to change because there are some powerful levers that can actually instantly change dynamics of work. And once the dynamics of work are changed, culture is the sum total of those dynamics. So it's partially true, partially false, but just this is to make a point that it isn't always a slow thing. There are some big moves that you can make quite instantaneously by changing the design of the work. Number four, let's go to question number four. Training is always necessary for changing behavior. 10 seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. Okay, fact, look at that. Let's look at the answer, Niha. Training is always necessary for changing behavior. This is actually a myth. It's not true. It depends on why people are behaving in a way that you do not desire. Sometimes they're behaving that way because they don't have the skill, in which case training is going to help a lot. Sometimes they're behaving that way because it doesn't meet some goal that is in their individual goal. It somehow doesn't align. That's why the behavior isn't right. So it's changing and the alignment of the goals that's important. And actually there was a recent study by CEB that showed that there's more than a 20% effect of the overall design of work of you know, how easy it is pe for people to make decisions and move on to the next step. And that actually creates a 20% bottleneck to how people behave. So redesigning work actually can take away 20% of the undesired behavior. So it's not always training. Wonderful. Question number five. The more passionate you are about the job, about your job, the less likely you are to burn out. 10 seconds. The more passionate you are about your job, the less likely you are to burn out. Five, four, three, two, and close. Where are we? Ooh, look at Ooh. that. Yeah. 
All right, what is the answer, Niha? Okay, the answer is, it is mostly a myth. A large part of this is a myth, and you are right. You guys are right on it. Because while passion is super important for you to be um, really connected to the work that you do and probably yeah. will create great quality of work, in terms of burnout, people who are super passionate might be at risk of tolerating more stress in service of their passion. So there could be conditions at work that are not ideal, but they'll put up with it. And over time, the cumulative effect actually creates more risk in this group for burnout. Wonderful. We are at the final question. If you are agile, you don't really need a strategy. 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six. Oh, I don't even need to, should I count? Or everyone is so clear. <laughs> <laughs> I am not counting on this one. <laughs> Okay, let's close this poll. I think everyone knows that being agile is not the same as having a clear direction and knowing clearly how to get there. Being agile does mean, however, that you have a clear process mm. to test when your assumptions are no longer valid and you need to adapt. So these are awesome. So I'm very, very happy with this. Right on point. Now, we're going to move to the next part, which actually brings some of this into sharp focus. And what I want to share, some of you may be aware of the concept of complex versus complicated. And you hear a lot of things like, oh, you know, we're moving into complex times, you know, things are no longer complicated. Well, I like to think of it in terms of this. There's the ordered environment where we live in where we kind of know what are the things that are happening. And then there's the unordered where things are a bit more, a bit less predictable. So let's click one down Niha, and then we'll have a discussion. We'll, we'll look at this very quickly. So in an ordered environment, we will see that mostly what we're dealing with is predictable because the cause and effect are clear. And if we know the cause and effect, we can repeat the outcome. Experts are really helpful because they can look at data analysis and they give us um, recommendations and best practices are really, really helpful because they help us um, apply what we need to do to, and we know the outcome is gonna be great. But if we click one down, you, you see that when you have an ordered environment, this is how you tend to organize work. We make sure we coordinate people, we align goals, we are cooperative, we optimize for efficiency and rules and governance are super important. Now let's move over. We also find ourselves in times of unordered. Now I don't mean to say that we are you know, less ordered nowadays and more unordered. I'm saying you will need to be aware and observant to know which condition you're dealing with in order to make the right decisions. Because when you're in the unordered, you'll realize, you'll, you'll notice that most of it is unpredictable and the conditions are novel, meaning they're new and they're changing. And instead of asking experts and looking at data, you actually just have to get out there and connect with the direct users. You have to actually directly engage to see what they're dealing with. And emergent practices means the opposite of best practice. It means something will come out through your engagement with people directly, and you'll realize, ah, actually doing this might work in this setting. And it's got very little to do with experts and best practice. Therefore, you end up organizing work like this. You rely more on collaboration. You co-create, you go out there and you create things together. You have to iterate. And the sense and response is probably the most important because you have to observe what is happening and then you, 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 you become very present. In the present moment, you respond to what is there. Enabling constraints are the opposite of rules and governance because you're not saying, yes, you can do this. No, you cannot do that. What you're saying is, I'm gonna create a boundary mm -hmm. that enables a lot of flexibility, but we know what we don't want to do, but everything within the boundary is empowered. 
So this is one of the most important elements in remembering what you need to, what kinds of choices you need to make when you design your organization. And if we go to the next slide, this is um, this is actually one of the, the my favorite, which is actually from Liz. Organizations like individuals can avoid identity crisis by deciding what it is they wish to be and then pursuing it with a healthy obsession. So it is about your choice. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the framework we would like to share with you. This is a very simple framework. It has three components and we like to call it the GRIN framework because we like to smile. <laughs> it stands for be grounded and be intentional. And I'll talk to you about the grounded part, the ground that we stand on. Liz will talk to you about the two other parts. Um, the thing to remember about this is it is a framework. It is not a model or a best practice for you to follow. Think of it as this is not a recipe for a cake, but it is a hack that will give you the important principles and techniques to create your own cake recipe based on your preferences or your realities. So, you know, if you love chocolate but hate strawberry and you like you're allergic to nuts and you live in the mountains with very high altitude and when you look at the framework, it will allow you to decide what kinds of recipes do I want to create. So from an organization perspective, you can think of it as an organization that wins through growing its community of users will be designed very differently from one that wins through innovation for specific solutions. So let's take this one at a time. The ground we stand on, the first click here talks about the context. So when you design your organization, your whatever the, the design, the purpose, the culture, whatever it is, it is actually an intentional answer to the reality that you're in. So you're not copying someone, but you're actually responding to the reality that you want to do business in. The purpose is why you exist. It needs to be super, super clear. Clear to employees, to users, to stakeholders, and it needs to be at a level where they believe in it, mm -hmm. at a level where they can connect with it to the point where they actually care that you succeed. And the final one is the principles, which is your worldviews, your beliefs, your intentions, what you always do, what you never do. And the important thing here is organizations that are led by principles are much more empowered, much more adaptive, they're more resilient, they're faster mm -hmm. because they don't have to rely on hierarchy, dictates, bureaucracy, or detailed instructions. So it's about when everyone is clear about where we're going and how we're gonna get there and what are the right things to do, people become much more autonomous and empowered. So let's, Liz, talk about the next two then. Exactly. So yeah, and the next one is um, after we have that foundation of the ground we're standing on, then we have to ask ourselves, how are we showing up? And so looking first, we're gonna first look at the aspect of power and structure. Okay, so if we look at what we have here under power and structure um, in terms of content, so here to that point of what's the context of, you know, what's the environment around you and to say, okay, how do you then create goals based upon the context, based upon the purpose and the principles you have in place? How do you, create an organizational structure that brings out the best in people, okay? So it brings out the best in people and it makes them easy to do the work to accomplish the strategy and delivers on that purpose, okay? So the reason why you have a structure is you're saying, okay, I wanna be able to fulfill these three things. It needs to bring out the best, needs to be able to easily do the work and have that informational flow and that you can deliver on that purpose as to why does your organization exist. So, um, and here you saw in that picture of fit over fashion, the five stars and Jay Gibber, I, th I think it was like 1965. So it's, or even earlier is the five star model. And the idea was, is that you have different poles in your organization that you need to design and you need to figure out um, how tight are these different elements and the points on the stars. So you have your five stars are strategy, structure, 
people, processes, and rewards. So a strategy that is going into your goals and directions. The structure, of course, is how are you then organized? The people are the type of people that you hire, promote, have in those critically important roles. Um, and the processes are really around what are the mechanisms for collaboration, information flow, communication, um, inside and outside of the organization. And then the fifth one are rewards in terms of what do you recognize? What do you celebrate? What's important? Um, so here, this is these are the pieces that as we look to an organization, we say, okay, how do you make those choices? Like, like um, Mandy said, you know, a company that's looking at innovation solutions, those five stars are going to be very different in terms of how tightly they are um, interwoven, as opposed to the one really focused on growth, where it's going to be some of those stars, for example, around process, um, those are going to be looser. Okay, so this is why we say it's fit over fashion as to what do you want to be in your organization. That's going to determine how tight or how loose those points on your star are. Okay, and the final one around power <laughs> and structure. So when I'm advising organizations and in my old role as the director for HR and global talent, I would always say power is a blunt instrument, use it wisely. And the number of direct reports has nothing to do with your power. Um, so here, as we look to what, what makes sense for your organization, really understanding what is it you want to be and how do you have those things set up really is, is the critical question as we talk to power and structure. Uh, the other aspect that, you know, here, the number of direct reports, and the other thing is as we look to um, power and structure is don't build your organization around current capabilities, okay? So I've seen this, and I know Mandy have seen this as well, is it's looking at the present rather than saying, you remember at the beginning, we looked at what is your ideal organization. So how are you actually able to grow into that is important as you look to and consider how are you have your power and your structure set up. So once you have that set up, these, your power and your structure, it also reflects in your leadership and in the culture in terms of how do these things play out. So leadership has got a brand new bag. As we talk about this, this ability to deal with ordered and unordered, we're dealing with both of those. So the father figure of having everything under control, that's not gonna fly anymore. So this piece around what is that collaboration? What is that empathy? What is that approach where you're really, um, fostering autonomy, where you're fostering mastery and purpose in people, that really plays out differently in terms of how we show up as leaders, and because leadership is not about the title. Um, so this is why the, that plays out, is um, here leaders, team, individual, and brand behaviors those are the ones that resonate with the principles and purpose. So Man Mandy mentioned it is principles are what you do and what you choose not to do. And this is then really clear. So I'll just take a, an example to say um, employee development is employee led, um, employee owned, manager led and organizationally championed. So if you have those principles, it's going to play out as to how do you deal with one another and what do you not do and how do you support the right things to do uh, because this is based in your principles, okay? So as we look to then what kind of culture that plays out is that it really shows up in, in this piece to say, we're looking in terms of hiring, promoting, all the things we do as a team and as a brand is around how do we have a principle and purpose fit where we say, okay, this, this will help bring us forward, that we have a culture add, that we're not homogenous, that it, that group thing cannot win, um, but that, that really that diversity and inclusion of different opinions is there, and that we're really understanding what is that impact for helping us move forward. So from taking us from the now organization to where we want to move to in the future, okay? So as we move forward, those aspects of how we show up go into the next piece um, is honestly the how we make it real every day. So if we look at um, what we have here is, I know Mandy's with me on this, is oftentimes you come to an organization and you see a beautiful poster about our vision, purpose, and this is how our values, and this is how we play out. 
And then you ask people what those are and they're like, ah, that's something on a poster. And this is the problem, okay? So as we look to what we have here in terms of how we make it real every day, we have to understand what is making it real. What is making it real is that environment around you in terms of talent. And talent is not only the people you have on your payroll, okay? So the talent ecosystem is really looking at what is all the talent available to us? So, you know, what are we buying? What are we borrowing? How, who are we promoting? Who are we retaining? Um, how are we growing in terms of what are those skills and capabilities that we need? Okay, and so thinking out of that aspect, understanding what affects them and their decision-making process, okay? So how do they work for you? So this is then how do we set up a talent strategy to match that, okay? It also shows up into the way of working. So here, Oftentimes, particularly when we were focused on efficiency, it was really about the what, you know, what were the results? How did they come in? What does this show up in the very kind of um, basic KPIs, the key performance indicators? This is where we say it's not only the what, but it's the how. So maybe some of you will remember, you know, we talk about what is that performance dimension? It's like, how are we walking the talk? How are we showing up? So are we breaking a lot of glass when we get into the room? Or are we really building up relationships that can withstand some strain and that we can build on each other's ideas? So it's really that way of working of how do we engage and work with each other. Um, the second piece to this, and um, Mandy touched upon that at the beginning, is this piece of people working with technology. So there's a lot of technology coming and not forcing ourselves into a corset, um, but saying, okay, technology actually working for people, because um, that has been perhaps in the past oftentimes where we retrofit our organization or processes to fit to a technology. And this is to say, how are we making sure that it works for us and it works for the people that we're doing? Because this then flows into, and this is really the key point of why does work exist in my life? So thinking about that third day of the conference um, here, it's that piece that people don't just want satisfaction. So just looking at employee satisfaction or employee engagement won't give you this aspect around how are we feeling fulfilled, meaning does do I see the purpose of my work? What is my autonomy? And how is my mastery? Those all go into how fulfilled am I? And because the question is, is how am I able with my purpose buy into what we're trying to accomplish together as a team and a group? So I'm looking at what is the impact that I have through my role? How am I able to grow? And here we're not just talking about training, we're talking about what do you get to do in your job that stretches you, where you feel that fire, where you're learning? Um, and then who do you get to go do it with? So then the relationships. So who um, that is a huge piece of this feeling fulfilled as to are we having that purpose-driven organization together? So this is that piece of, this is then where the grin comes in, um, really around that purpose-driven of how do we feel? So this is the model um, that we're looking at and just wanted to, to get across to you. What are those different elements that you think of as you're looking to bake that cake of your organization? What are those ingredients and what is the environment that you're baking your cake in? So now we're gonna go on to a, a second piece and we're going to be doing this again a little bit in interaction, okay? So as remember, um, and you feel free um, to think about where your organization is now, if you wanted to put that annotate now that we've gone through that, go ahead and put your check mark as to um, where, put your X mark as to where your organization is now. So go ahead and do that under annotate. So where it is now, put an X. And then where you would like it to be, put a check. Okay. Okay. So if you have that in your head, all right, we're gonna go on to the next piece, which is um, here, perfect. We're gonna go on the next piece, which is then how do we make this real? I love it, all right? <laughs> Somewhere in that middle, okay? Very nice. Okay, so you have that in your head. 
as to the check of where you would like it to be and where you are now. All right, so now we're gonna ask you what's behind that? Why, you know, why do we have this gap and what is that important gap and what can we do to address it so that we can make that forward movement more towards that ideal organization, okay? All right, so I'm just looking at the time here. So we're gonna do this quite quickly. This is, uh, we, we just want to give you a, a, a few moments, literally just two minutes of quiet, of silence to allow you to almost check in with yourself to listen to your own needs. Why do you do what you do? Yeah. So I'm just going to read out a couple of questions and I would encourage you to just be completely silent, take deep breaths and just try to see if you can pick up, if you can notice how your body, how your heart is answering these questions. Why do you do what you do? Yeah. Why this job? Why this organization? Why this industry? What do you want? And why is that important? And to whom? So this is of course something that you would want to spend a little bit more time on, but we're running a little behind. So I wanna just say, I hope you realize just with that two minutes of quiet, you realize how important it is for all of us to know these answers for ourselves. At least even if we don't know the answers yet, we spend the time exploring it. And the thing I want you to ask yourself is, do you know the answer to these questions for the people you work with, for the people you lead? because that has a lot to do with how they make sense and make meaning and get enjoyment out of working where they do. And Liz, over to you. Perfect, thank you. And it is, it's that foundation for how we then show up. So as we move forward, and you guys will have seen um, Niha put in the, the link, so we'll just move one slide forward. Um, and we're gonna be looking at getting to the why, okay? So you see here on a, Q, a QR code, but um, it's also in the link. So if you could follow that link, we're going to be answering the following question. So it's getting to that why. So based upon what um, Mandy um, just asked, and we're thinking about the impact that you want to have, and you think about you know, where we plotted you know, where you are now and where you would like to be, what are some of those biggest blockers getting in your way? Okay, so just follow this QR code or the link in the chat, and it should then take you um, to this site. There, I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. I it's fine. Perfect. Right. So this is what it will look like. You'll come in. So this is just showing what it will look like on your. Uh, on your mobile. So then just go to the main room where it says all start here. So please go and check that and that's where you will you will start. Okay, so think about the impact you have and where you all now and where you want to be. Okay. And we will switch then over. All right, lack of similar mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll be doing this also fairly quickly. So 10 seconds, all right. What are some of those blockers getting in the way? Self-belief, nice, very important. Mm -hmm. All right, seven. Okay, unsure of state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. The pandemic. pandemic. Yep. Education. Yeah, different varying states. And perhaps also experience. Okay, my mind. Mm hmm. 
Market. Less exposure, true. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if we look at this, um, we will see, okay, lack of decision making. Mm hmm. All right. Okay. So less exposure, pandemic. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we could group this into two categories. One looks to be an internal mm -hmm. state of mind, you know, something that's happening inside us. And then there's another category, which is external, which is more task oriented or in the outer world, decision making, education, pandemic, um, similar interests. So, yeah, I'm wondering that might help if that might mm -hmm. help the next exercise. Yeah, I completely agree. And so let's, I, I completely agree. So let's maybe make, um, you know, that we have one group for the next exercise, looking at what is that internal state of mind and that internal kind of being around the self-doubt, unsure, and then the, the other one to be looking at the task in the outer. So I'm going to go back um, to our presentation. Um, okay, so moving forward one. Okay, and we're going to ask you and you'll see and then um, we'll put this in the chat so that we're going to be looking at these two blockers. So the first blocker is then um, here looking at internally. So blocker one is internally internal state of mind. Niha, shall we go to the next slide? Yeah. Thank you. And, and one more click. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. So what Liz is typing there is in blocker one will be internal and blocker two will be external. So we're going to get put you into um, into breakout rooms. Okay. So um, each of these breakout rooms, you will see on the, uh, um, we'll have a, a question. So you can just, if you are on then Slido, you can then pick out A, uh, you will be doing blocker one, which is the internal state of mind out of the employee and team member point of view. If you are in group C, you will pick out uh, on Slido uh, the word cloud group C and you will be doing the blocker internal state of mind, but this time out of the leadership and senior management point of view. So, and Justin, I believe you will be dividing our wonderful participants into uh, the different rooms, correct? Yes, I will. Okay. There'll be two breakout rooms. Yes, perfect. All right. Perfect. So everybody in the breakout rooms, you can then uh, take your take your point of view on Slido and then fill out that word cloud. And then we'll see what are those different impressions as to why do these blockers exist out of the perspective of the, of the employee, team member, or the leadership point of view. Perfect, and we'll be giving us three minutes. What we wanted to do here is just to kind of say, thinking about these different perspectives, thinking about these different ways of looking as to why do these, um, why do these elements then exist? Um, we'll just go back one slide. Um, it's, it's that piece of as you look to those blockers, as you look to what are those internal state of mind out of the employee or the senior leadership point of view, how can this influence where you are now and where you want to go? Okay, so with that, I'll turn it over then to, to Mandy um, to talk us through as to what is that ideal organization and where does it really come back to that ground that we stand on? Perfect. All right. So I'm um, mindful sorry, of the sorry, Wendy. Sorry, sorry, Wendy. Yeah. Hello. Sorry. Uh, I don't think I don't think the people in the breakout rooms can hear you, and I've seen w one of the persons asking for help. So I'm thinking if I would allocate Monday in one room and Elizabeth uh, in the other. Uh, can room. you stop the breakout rooms yeah. and bring everybody back in, please? Sorry, bring them back in. Okay. Sure. Sorry, we should have made that more clear. Apologies, Justin. <laughs> Sorry, no problem. 
So welcome back, everybody. <laughs> in, in 17 seconds. In, ah, OK. 17 seconds. So how about I just take this to the, yeah. we'll talk take about it home. Yeah. We have to questions because I, I just wanted to set the time. And then we'll share the grin. Um, they, at the they should be back. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, apologies for the bit of confusion. We had some communications, misfires and breakout group um, gremlins attacked us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the interest of time, we're going to move very quickly through this because I hope we will have at least a couple minutes for questions. So the final thing I want to share is the organization's purpose is really one of the most important things. If your organization does not have a clear purpose, it will appear fuzzy to people. Yeah. That's why we chose this picture. When someone thinks about the name of an your name of your organization, you need to be very sure that they aren't seeing you in a fuzzy way, that they're completely clear what you stand for, how you do things and how you never do things. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next slide, here are some questions that I would encourage you to ask of your organization. Why does the world need you? Who cares about your success? What will you do when you're tested? You meaning your organization, what will it do when it's tested? What do you, who do you really serve? Mm -hmm. It's a real good question here, especially for those with shareholders. Mm -hmm. Why do people work for you? Like really, why do they work for you? Remember at the very beginning of the session, we said our job in designing organizations is to create a culture that works for people so that they can work for us. Yeah. And finally, what will be permanently different in the world because you existed? It sounds grandiose, but that's the kind of clarity that you need. It ties to why does the world need you? Because if you're just one of many or what you're just, you know, another one, then it's less important for you to be mindful and choiceful about what you do. So then the next is something that we want to leave with you. This next slide, um, the link, if Liz can put the link again yep. in the chat, you don't have the time to do this right now, but we would really encourage you to download this document and spend some quality time with yourself and go through this. You know, what is the impact you want to create? How are you growing? And what are the relationships you are creating? Because that's really how you arrive at what is purposeful for you and therefore what is also purposeful for your organization. Um, and we want to, I know we're at the top of the hour and I don't know if they'll let us stay on, but we'll definitely stay on if you have any questions. Unmute yourself or on chat, either way it's fine. Earlier on, I did see a question in chat as to, uh, you asked what does people exploration mean in the earlier uh, chart that we had? It is, it's simply, it's actually two separate words. Is your organization focused on people? And is your organization focused on exploration as in exploring possibilities? And because the opposite side of that continuum was, is your organization focused on tasks versus people? And versus is your organization first focused on efficiency versus exploration? So those are the two continuums. Let's take a look. Mandy, yes. hi, this is Urvashi. Can I ask a quick question? Of I do course. need to drop off, but- Of course. Um, I'm so glad I got to attend this session. Thank you so much. I, I, I can't tell you how important this is, uh, especially you know when you start uh, sort of reaching leadership positions and know, understanding that organizational culture is so so important to actually growing, uh, growing and sort of keeping every mo everyone motivated. I wanted to ask a question about purpose in general. Uh, so I know you know because we're in the impact sector sometimes. Um, you know, purpose for us means a little different. But I mean, what if you were making like paint, you know, in an organization just doing that? I mean, sometimes <laughs> it doesn't seem that purposeful. I mean, does that, how, how do you create that 
sort of uh, it, how do you build that sort of purpose in organizations like that? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. So I'll take it first. Um, there are a couple ways I, I, I want to approach this one. One is the purpose doesn't have to be grand. Mm. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It doesn't have to be like, I want to save every single whale in the world. Um, it, what it must be though, it must contain words and images and spirit that is magical to you, to your organization and to the people who are in the organization. So the short way of saying this is if there's a way you can engage your people, particularly the leaders, but better of everyone, to go through a process where they explore what's important to them. And then through the next step of the process together, they will co-create a purpose that is meaningful overall. And, and that is actually the best way to come to a purpose that means something to you. Now, the other side of the purpose is the impact that you want to make in the external world. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example. I don't have, you know, what's a great purpose for a paint company in my head right now, but I will give you an example. I was working with the prison system in Singapore. Um, I was talking to them and here's the interesting thing. Their, they thought their purpose was to contain um, people who need to be incarcerated safely um, so that they ser serve out their sentence and to keep them away from society so that they pay their dues. After the conversation about purpose in the workshop and people understanding the importance for individual connection, they realize that what they want their purpose to be, that's the key word, what they want their purpose to be is the purpose of the prison is to, um, is to help the people who come in leave us as better members of society as quickly as possible and never come back. So when they say it that way, it becomes very clear to them that they now need to revisit the policies, their practices, the, the, you know, how they provide activities, how they treat their prisoners. So that is actually the real purpose of a purpose. It helps you look at all the things that you do, whether they're all pointing in a direction that makes you proud. Very well said, very well said. Great. Any other questions? So one came in to say, I'm curious to know whether it's possible to build an organization in a lean way, you know, in terms of the least amount of capital used, while still following the GRIN methodology, practical examples would help. So um, yes, absolutely. So this is me coming from automotive supply. <laughs> Exactly. I use, I, um, so I am very good at uh, <laughs> value stream analysis. Absolutely. So the piece is, you know, if you look at lean, it's really about how are you empowering the people within um, to really rethink their work? What would be a better way? What's be, what would be this piece to say, how are we focusing? And this is where I think there's been a problem with a lot of lean that has been focused on operational efficiency. Um, rather than saying, is this effective? Does this make sense to be doing it this way? So coming back perhaps a little bit to those to those core origins or the original religion of lean to say, okay, how are we really looking at what is the effective way to do it this? And what is the scale? So really, as we think to lean also considering, you know, one size does not need to fit all. And how are you empowering and how are you having different councils working together and really building upon and co-creating um, what makes sense for what you're trying to accomplish. So hopefully that helps that question. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so because we are over time and Niha just brought us to the last slide, <laughs> one thing we want to mention is, um, as you know, you know, we said this was a very, very, very short taster session. Mm. Each one of the components we talked about, there's of course lots of um, meat behind it. We need to dig into it. Um, this is where we will be for the Future of Work conference in, in, organized by Artin in December. Um, and attached to that, there's also uh, not just a masterclass, but a series, a certification series, where we go into much more detail in each of the components. So very, very happy to have you here. I'm so happy to have done this.
I couldn't agree more. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your wonderful questions and engaging. All right, cheers. cheers.